we prepared a little bit of data for this uh, specific demo, but there's also inside of the MemeML library, a lot of data that you can load, can load yourself um, to try it out. And I highly encourage uh, to pip install and go have a look yourself. So this is basically the data I described. We have a bunch of features um, and then again, predictions and the target. And if we go and look at the analysis data, the data of the model introduction, we are missing, of course, uh, the target, which we would normally use to compare both and get a notion of the performance. So the first thing we're going to do in our monitoring flow, and this is really what, we're, what we preach uh, and what we're all about, is to obsess over performance. And this is both machine learning performance from a technical point of view, but also um, the business performance and the business impact. And in this use case, we're mainly focusing on the technical performance, but this business performance is always something to bear in mind as well. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, quickly get our features. And then when we instantiate our performance estimation algorithm, in this case, it's because it's regression, we use dialect, direct uh, loss estimation. Um, and all of our uh, uh, estimation algorithms and detection algorithms kind of work the same, where when we instantiate, we do some type of mapping between what type of data this algorithm has to see to kind of come up with this conclusion and with how things are named in the data set. So we have the target, the prediction, which uh, columns are the features. We also decide on which granularity we want to chunk the data. Do we want it on a day, a month, an hour? Um, what column contains uh, the time dimension and which metrics that we're interested in. Specifically for this algorithm or the direct uh, loss estimation, we also can specify uh, whether we want this algorithm to be very, uh, very, very much hyper tuned and specifically working on this use case. What we do then is then fit this algorithm on the reference period, um, and it's going to look for a lot of patterns, and then we can kind of use these patterns to estimate the performance on the analysis. I'm just quickly going to run this, and then we can also visualize. Um, and get an idea of how our performance, how our machine learning model is doing without having access to the target. Remember this data frame did not contain the target. Uh, and what we do with direct loss estimation is that we leverage the test data um, and we basically calculate, calculate the loss using um, the prediction and the target present in test data. And then we train a new machine learning model predicting um, the loss directly. So we're not calculating the error, a uh, small difference here because error would be just uh, subtracting predictions from the um, custom lifetime value in this case, but we're also squaring it like how it's typically done in the machine learning metrics or taking an absolute value so that um, the measurements are not signed and that makes it also easier um, to predict. So basically what this is doing, this is training machine learning model uh, using the test data so that then in production, uh, we can based on what we feed to this machine learning that we train here, we can get an estimate of how the how the model is most likely uh, gonna perform. And again, based on the test sets, we set some thresholds and when uh, our performance, when, when the error exceeds, actually in this case, the loss exceeds a certain threshold, we as data scientists are gonna be alarmed because our models are not performing as they used to be and we'll have, we'll have to delve in deeper and come up with a plausible root problem. Uh, one thing, that we should then do as part of this, this diagnostics is to run multi-variate coverage. Um, and this is also a custom algorithm inside of the MediML lab. It kind of works the same. It's called a data reconstruction drift calculator. Uh, and it's the same thing. Um, we do some type of mapping towards the data when it instantiates, we fit in the reference and then we make calculation um, on the analysis period. And how this algorithm works, it looks at the reference period and it trains a PCA object that does some um, um, decompression and then compresses the data again. And then this compressed, decompressed, compressed data is basically a new type of data set that went to this transformation and we can compare it and we can measure error. Uh, and if when we move into production, the data that we feed it in production is different than this compression and this decompression, which hasn't changed and which is based on the reference period, is going to make um, and transform the data in such a way that this new data set that we're creating that way is different, and this reconstruction error is going to go up. And that is our, the main sign for multivariate data drift. 
And this also captures the relationship linear between uh, the different features inside of the input space. And we can also see that in this period, um, there is some multivariate data drift happening. And after we have established that, we can delve in deeper and go at univariate feature level. Um, same thing again, we have a uni univariate drift calculator where we can um, set some statistics, set some dis uh, distance metrics uh, that we can use out of the box to calculate uh, um, univariate uh, feature drift. And then we can do the same thing and visualize some of the features that uh, have drifted over time. Um, and this is specifically for us to go and look at a feature level and probably need some um, expert knowledge or maybe sit down with somebody that has a deep business understanding to piece together why our machine learning models are failing. And for instance, here we can see that our spending actually inside of our application goes up and specifically the lower uh, the threshold of customers not spending that much is not that uh, much present in the last month. So that is an observation that we'll have to take in and we'll have to um, sit down and discuss why this actually might have happened. Um, then we see something curious here, which is the data plan usage, because um, distributions haven't changed that much, yet we see some alerts here in these two periods. And this is also a period where there was clearly no drop in performance. And this is something that is bound to happen if we use statistical tests, because these statistical tests are very sensitive. Uh, in the way, in the sense that we have a lot of features in our data set, we apply these statistical uh, sets, uh, tests over time. Um, we can apply some a uh, correction like Bonferroni or something that that um, should um, incorporate some of this um, repeating of tests and make it a little bit more robust. But unfortunately, this is these are not the best methods in that sense. Uh, and what this will create is a lot of false alarms, and that is exactly what we're seeing here. Because technically, as data scientists, we don't want to be notified uh, when a feature like this drifted and our performance is not impacted. Of course, for a data engineer or from a data quality perspective, this can hold valuable information. But from a performance perspective, if everything is still working, that is not something that we would want to go and investigate. Uh, so that is also really why we obsess over performance first and kind of follow this flow of performance and then drilling down and then only using uh, covariate shift detection as a way to come up with an explanation and not as a standalone detection system, because you will just get too much uh, false alarm, alarms and you can already filter out these false alarms by just focusing uh, on the period that there was actually a drop in performance estimated. Um, and then we can see that there's also some other features changing, like you can see some uh, changes on the contract duration going up and again, a false alarm. And also for categoric features, uh, we can apply the same logic. Uh, here we see that in this last few months, this uh, product type is not present anymore. And maybe that is the type of product that is also related with the lower amount of spending on the platform. And that is something to be investigated. And now it's up to us to put everything together and to basically go and decide uh, what the next steps are. and maybe based on what our automated alerts are we can trigger uh, continuous retraining uh, if not we might want to take the use case down refactor it look into deeper look at the business process um, rebuild the machine learning model or fall back on a previous model a lot of things of next steps that we can do uh, but if we understand why our model is not performing we're going to be able to take better decisions of why these things um, on how these things can be resolved. And that is it, kind of, that is it uh, for the, the monitoring flow. If you have any questions, uh, be sure to put them in the chat and then after a presentation in 20 minutes, uh, we, can, we can quickly discuss them. Later, of course, uh, when um, the time window has passed and the, the targets become available, we can also, of course, measure the real performance. And we can also see that during these three months, um, there was an actual drop in performance, but we would only really know this after a uh, longer time. Um, so this is one of the advantages of estimating performance is that you don't have to wait for the ground truth and you can act instantly. And we can also look at the model outputs, which is typically something uh, a lot of people already do and how these distributions change. However, 
even though model output is in a way also aggregating the feature space um, into like uh, a single dimension, we're still applying a statistical test. And again, here uh, we see that there is a period when there is actually no drop in performance, and yet the model output distribution has changed a little bit. So not something we need to worry about. Uh, but if we wouldn't have an alerting system, which would be just doing a coverage chip, again, we would get a false alarm for this. Um, inside of our library, um, we also have different tests. Um, right now, I'm just visualizing the Kolomodor of Smirnov test. Um, but I actually also know that Jensen Shannon is also a little bit more robust um, to these type of changes. So we could also run this and then potentially um, not get alerted. And this is also the trade-off of different univariate drift detection metrics. And this can be part of the configuration of your monitoring system. Uh, but ideally, um, these things are also bypassed by focusing on um, the estimated performance. 